Welcome to the Hub. My name is Richard England. I'm going to take 30 seconds or so to introduce these uh, fine artists. Sometimes it takes a second act to find your passion. And both of these artists, Caddy Smith and Linda Hoffmeister, each arrived at the outstanding creative effort you see here relatively later in their lives uh, so far. Uh, Linda was a radiation therapist who tried quilting but couldn't cut straight, thank goodness, because that led her to turn tradition on its head and not only create images out of the fabric, but in many cases create the fabrics themselves. Caddy spent the early years of her life earning multiple degrees, moving repeatedly around the United States and extensively volunteering. Various forms of artistic expression crept into her life, but the extraordinary sculpture you see here began for Caddy just eight years ago. Caddy and Linda have been working on this collaborative effort for over a year. I will let the two of them tell you about what inspired them, but I give you Caddy Smith and Linda Hoffmeister with the female spirit, all fired up and stitched down. <laughs> for coming. I think I get to say a few words first. Richard was very kind. He didn't tell you that when I started I was 65. So I just want to say... She revealed her age, not me. <laughs> it's never too late to find out what your passion in life is and to go for it. But I can tell you in those eight years I've hardly stopped to take a breath. It's just been unbelievable. I just can't get enough of it. So um, women or what I sculpt, period, basically now. Um, it took a, a few tries at other things before I realized that that was really my passion. And it's about strong women. I grew up in the family with really strong women, and that is my influence. So the pieces you see here today really have no political ideas connected with them. They're simply about strong women who are everywhere in this world. So um, I will tell you about a few of the pieces, and um, then if you have questions, we'll do that. Um, this one is Freedom's Journey, and um, this woman is very stern and very strong because her life has to be miserable. But <laughs> this is like looking down on a boat of immigrants who are um, trying to reach the shores for freedom. So when the airplane, if you were up in an airplane and taking a picture down, you would see all these faces looking up at you. So that's my inspiration. Of course, the American flag speaks for itself. This one, um, um, named Born to Dream, and um, I think she's a very strong woman um, who is facing a lot of indecision in her life. And as you look around, um, there are some very distorted um, dream pictures on it. And on the back of it, you'll see a flag of Mexico and one of the United States. But as I say, these are not political statements for me. They're simply about strong women. And a week after I'd finished this sculpture in a um, Daytona News Journal, there was a picture of a young woman in the story and she lived in Miami, and she was a college student, and she was a dreamer, and she looked exactly like this woman. And not only that, her head in the photograph was tilted the same way. And I cut it out, and yeah, it, it was pretty incredible. So anyway, that was my inspiration. Um, this piece, The Patriot, um, when I look at her, I almost think I should have named her Ridden Hard and Put Away Wet. <laughs> I don't, and you know, some of you may know that saying that we were, yeah, the old saying that somebody's really worked hard in their life and whatever, they've been ridden hard and put away wet. But um, one of the things I did was research quilts from pioneer days. And I found this remarkable story about this couple who um, settled somewhere in the middle of Texas. And for him to um, go get supplies, it would take two weeks. So she was left alone out in the middle of nowhere. And they had a cow. And uh, this 
really bad storm came up and it was so bad she would have to tie a rope around her body and tie it to the tree to go feed the cow so the wind wouldn't blow her away. Mm -hmm. And she said the one thing that kept her um, sane during this time was that she had peace work with her in the ditch that she was in trying to survive the storm. So in other words, she was clumpy. <laughs> So sometimes you have to do a lot of research when you are, you know, sculpting or doing whatever. Um, most of the time when I sculpt, I take 25 pounds of clay and put it on my modeling stand and I just start working. I don't have an image in my mind as to what it's going to look like and I'm usually pretty amazed when somebody's looking back at me and uh, she wasn't planned. So that's really thrilling. And everything you see is hollowed out, of course, because clay um, can't be fired if it's solid. So you have to cut it. Once you sculpt it, you have to cut the head off or do something and get all the clay out and put it back together. So my, my process now with all the color is that I use a um, product called Terra Sigillata, which is a byproduct of clay. And it's uh, clay and some chemicals, and it's very thin and a little cloudy looking. And I make my own colors by using mason stains, and that's a powdery substance color. And I mix the color, and when the piece is dry, I put the color on it. And then I fire it the first time and um, take it out of the kiln, and sometimes it's wonderful, and sometimes it's not. It's always a surprise. That's the thing with clay, it's always a surprise. And then I put a product called uh, Copper Oxide Wash all over the piece, and it turns it totally black. And I take a sponge, and I wipe that off, and all the dark sticks in the crevices, which defines the work and makes it stand out. So all the incising and everything I do on the sculptures then, you know, has depth to it. Then I fire it again. So it is quite a process, and but it is way too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I love every minute of it. So um, there you go. And But big pieces like this lady here and the one out in the front by the front desk, um, the really big pieces I make by coiling, and that you roll out pieces of clay like snakes, and you design it and attach them and make the pieces. And each piece has a top and a bottom so it can thread over a, an iron rod that's in the middle which supports it. So it's almost like having to be in architect to figure this out, but um, it's really fun to do. I love working big. And so this one is four pieces, and the one you see out front by the front door is seven pieces. So anyway, I love working big. <laughs> and I love women, uh, you know, all over the world, and um, they're my inspiration. How long does it take you to put one piece? Well, it depends on the piece and the drying process. I would probably sculpt her in three days. But then she's got to, I work really fast because, you know, I work a lot. <laughs> and um, then she has to dry. Then I put the color on, uh, I fire it, take it out, put the color on, and fire it again. So it just depends. The weather has a lot to do with how it dries. So um, sometimes longer than other times, but I'm, I work pretty fast. Do you use an electric kiln? I do. I have an electric kiln. Okay. It's like 21 inches deep and 16 inches wide, 17. So that I'm restricted because of that size to the size of what I can make. So that's why I have to make pieces. So anyway, I highly recommend it to anyone. It doesn't matter what age you are. You can just start with that answer. <laughs> <laughs>
my business. I was going to say, uh, are any of those in art? I have an ES and an MBA. Never dreamed nothing, nothing that I wanted to do it. I never took an art class oh until I was 65. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. She's also a fabulous tennis player. Oh, she was a very strong woman in many ways. Well, I would love, I'm Linda Hoffmeister, other part of this team, and I would like to welcome you all so, so much for our exhibit. We have worked long and hard, and I feel very humbled that you're all here. Thank you. Uh, my journey began kind of really late in life, too. Um, no art classes, no anything. Um, big family. And then my grandmother and my aunt were quilters, and they inspired me. But as Richard said, I couldn't cut straight. I still can't cut straight. And I can't make corners match, so I thought, eh, that's not for me. So I just decided I'm going to branch out and do whatever I want to do. So I've just been on this wonderful, wonderful journey that has just led me, just, I, I cannot tell you the excitement that has engaged. And, and the excitement is never ending. I mean, every morning I wake up and I can't wait to get in the studio and, and start again. Already my mind is click, 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 click about what, what's going to happen next. So um, during our life and, and marriage to Bill, We've traveled and I've collected different textiles, different, I'm a hunter and gatherer and I pick up all kinds of weird things and I bring them home and um, I have loved incorporating other women's art into mine. The, the forgotten woman whose name is unknown and making her a part of my creation, like this kimono. Or, or this uh, Asian piece. Not your piece. Not your This, this, uh, there's four parts of a uh, kimono that was given to me, and it was stained, it was dirty, it had been in somebody's trunk forever, and the person who gave it to me said, you have my blessing, cut it up, do whatever you want. So it, it, it was in my studio for about nine months. I kept looking at it, and I kept putting fabric up, and I thought, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. And finally I thought, it needs new life. It's not going to go anywhere. So I took the plunge, cut it up, but I did incorporate, I left some of her hand quilting in there. And um, so I feel like that we are joined. Um, over here I have all kinds of in the South American, I, I love traveling in South America, I, from um, Guatemala to Peru to um, Antigua to uh, Argentina. There's belts that I've collected. I incorporate so much of these different things. There's, you know, when you look around at all the pieces, there's just parts of people and their art that I I love to create and and to make. You know, to make these women, I mean, I, I look at, well, an example of the, the blue on uh, Guatemala, and on Antigua, excuse me. Um, I bought it in a market, and I, I told the woman, I said, I'm, I'm going to make some art, and I want you to know that you're going to be included in it. Yeah, we had an interpreter, a big, big smile, and she, they were so happy. So I feel like that, that we're all sisters in the cloth. And, and, and dignity of women. But I, I really, um, in this little cove back here, these, these were not really created for the series, but they really needed to be in. This piece is one of, it's a tribute to grandmother. And she was such a strong, strong woman. And she um, was raised in Oklahoma, where my brother Ron, who is here, and I were from. And she was um, so strong and so powerful and so humble. And when she was mad, she would never say bad words. She had a little ditty that my aunts repeated to me, which I, I did this in 2002. This was my first out-of-the-box 
uh -huh. um, thing. I you know, didn't do a pattern. It was my first attempt. But it's called Peace in the Valley. And her name is Alpha Omega Parker Hale, 1891 to 1962, Blanchard, Oklahoma. And her little ditty that she said was, when I'm sad, I want to go to the mountains to pick blackberries and hunt turkey nest. I will dye my hair purple and change my name to green and never be seen. <laughs> now, how far advanced was this woman? <laughs> we have a granddaughter with purple hair. <laughs> As, as you look around it and you feel what Caddy and I have, have we've, we've worked, and the biggest joy to me is working with her, and we have bounced things back and forth, but we have not really, um, we, you know, we've gotten together, we've talked, we've sent pictures and everything, but I, I think that our exhibit has come together, and it really exudes the female spirit and, and her strength. And we thank you so much for being here.